Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Philosophy Hour of Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we summarize the philosophy of Jean-Paul Sartre, specifically his work, Being and Nothingness. Sartre was among the most famous of the modern existentialists and phenomenologists, perhaps second only to Martin Heidegger in importance. Sartre is one of the great modern philosophers, too, who is generally a canonical figure for anyone studying the history of philosophy. Sartre's great text of fame was his essay on ontology, being and nothingness. In typical French fashion, the text is weighty, dense, and draws heavily from the history of philosophical thought, consciousness, ethics, politics, the influences, as well as rebuttals include Christianity, Bacon, Descartes, Hegel, Husserl, Nietzsche, and of course, Martin Heidegger. The opening paragraph of Sartre's great work begins, Modern thought has realized considerable progress by reducing the existence to the series of appearances which manifest it. Its aim was to overcome a certain number of dualisms which have embarrassed philosophy and to replace them by the monism of the phenomenon. Has the attempt been successful? Anyone who is a student of modern philosophy, especially German idealism, knows what that dualism or those certain numbers of dualism that Sartre speaks of, the great crisis of dualism, of object and subject, of nature and the self, was always at the core of modern philosophy, and that is what Sartre is dealing with. Sartre's famous opening addresses the problem of dualisms that the various philosophical monisms or the unitive philosophies post-Bacon, post-Descartes attempted to resolve. However, Sartre's opening is somewhat misleading, since many other prominent phenomenologists and philosophers before him aren't really monists, even though that would be the implication of reading his opening statement. What was, however, Sartre's grander concern? First was the implied dualism and bad faith of Christianity. The separation of man into elect and damned, heaven and hell, soul and body, etc., was a problem that modern philosophy had to overcome. Although Christianity properly rejects dualism as a heresy, and its teachings are part of a pre-modern, unitive, dare one say monistic theology, Sartre nevertheless sees a certain dualism within Christianity as embarrassing to modern philosophy. Second, is the functional dualism of the materialist monists of the new science, who although they were monists because by definition if matter is the only thing that exists, then there is only one cause of existence, thus mono, monism. Francis Bacon, René Descartes, Jean Locke, Thomas Hobbes, and all of the great English utilitarian and empirical philosophers were nevertheless functional dualists in bringing about a philosophy that posited matter on one hand, and subject on the other. The resulting dualism, the functional dualism of modern philosophy and the new science was in separating man from nature, thus pitting man versus nature in philosophical functionality. And that, of course, for anyone who has listened to our lectures on German Romanticism and Idealism was the great conflict that the German idealists were dealing with in their philosophies. 
This is a continuation of that battle. Sartre's contest with the separating dualism of man versus nature as a product of materialist philosophy. Third was the mind-body or subject-matter dualism, of course, of Descartes and all of subsequent phenomenological philosophy. Man as subject consciousness was primarily and historically understood to be immaterial and not material. But man is enclosed in a body. This leads to the subject-object crisis that preoccupies much of modern ontology. Is man as subject and consciousness immaterial or material? Sartre sees the history of modern philosophy as the attempt to resolve these historic dualisms, but thinks ultimately that the entire historical project, beginning with Christianity, continuing with the philosophy of the new science, continuing even further with German idealism, has been unsuccessful. And this is where his work steps in. Ontology is the study of being. A further derivation of ontology is anthropology, specifically the study of being human. Properly, it should be tied to metaphysics when being logically coherent. For instance, a materialist metaphysic should necessitate a materialist ontology. An idealist metaphysic should necessitate an idealist ontology. A monistic metaphysic should necessitate a monistic ontology. And you can see how if you start with a particular axiom, logically you should end with the resulting ontology from where you began. A pluralist metaphysic, of course, should necessitate a pluralist ontology. And this is some of the problem with the ancient philosophies as well as Christian theology, because in their attempt to have a unitive ontology and unitive metaphysic within their pluralism, this inherent instability leads to a functional dualism that Sartre sees to be embarrassing and that modern philosophy has to overcome and that modern philosophy up to his time has never been able to overcome. But where and why do humans, more specifically for Sartre, in this study of ontology have subjectivity? This has become the great question of modern philosophy, especially as inherited from German idealism. If we are matter, as modern physics and materialist science suggests, where does subjectivity come from? If it emanates from matter, then we still have the problem of Descartes' mind-body dualism and the contradiction of the new science which separated man from nature. If consciousness came from matter, e.g. nature, then man should be seen as part of nature rather than opposed to it, rather than a creature utilizing force and power to transform nature, which was the purpose of the new science. Sartre's attempt to resolve the problem of dualism is based on his metaphysics of nothingness. What does he mean? And where does he draw from? Many observers have noted that Sartre's work falls into two major traditions in philosophy. First is the post-Hegelian phenomenological tradition. Though scholars remain divided as to whether Sartre misinterpreted Hegel, Husserl, and Heidegger, or whether he was rejecting their efforts while substantially drawing from their works, that isn't too much of a concern for us here because the fact is misinterpreted or not, he is deeply influenced by the post-Hegelian phenomenological tradition. Second, he is ironically influenced by the post-Christian theological anthropology of the West, specifically from St. Augustine and Catholicism. Both factor prominently in between the lines of the text 
as all serious scholars know. But Sartre's work is not one of Christian apologia. Sartre is, of course, an atheist, and he finds the Christian tradition of philosophy and theology to be embarrassing for the modern mind. However, that theological anthropology, that study of man, that focus on the humanism, that man is the crown jewel of creation, that he possesses a rational intellect, are all carried over into Sartre's philosophy. He accepts the Christian and Augustinian theological anthropology while divorcing it from its metaphysics and embracing it and merging it with post-Hegelian phenomenology. Part of Christianity's doctrine of creation, as most of us know, is creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing. God, all-powerful as God is, created the cosmos at a beginning moment, which is also the beginning of time. We shall pass over the philosophy of time for the sake of time in this lecture, but it is important for us to recall this basic proposition in Christianity's theological anthropology. But Christianity's triune doctrine of creation also includes the idea that the cosmos is rationally ordered, that it is rationally created, and is created in love for love. Creatio ex amor dei, creation from the love of God. Because the world is rationally ordered and made in love, there is truth to it that we could come to know and that we can relate to affectionately with others and the world according to Christianity. You should see how this also falls within the phenomenological tradition. That idea of subject encountering objects and coming to know it in truth and love. This is inherited by Sartre. He is dealing with the same questions, the same concerns. However, while he accepts that man possesses a rational intellect, is a subject within the world and relates to it, he rejects, and this is his decisive break with Christianity, Sartre rejects that the world is rationally ordered and that it was made in love for love. This is the great lie of Christianity, and all the subsequent philosophies, even political ideologies, that are secretly influenced by the Christian tradition. Anyone who is arguing, whether it is in science, philosophy, human nature, or politics, that the world is rationally ordered and that love is a real force, is implicitly adopting the Christian metaphysic. Sartre argues, even though we are rational and possess a rational intellect in which we try to understand the cosmos, the only logical conclusion we can arrive at is that the world is not rationally ordered, that the cosmos is not rationally ordered, and that love doesn't really exist. The cosmos is not ordered to anything and certainly was not made in love for love. Thus, we cannot know the truth of the universe because there is no transcendental order to it. And we cannot come to love because love is not integral to the stitches of the cosmos. Instead of returning then to the pagan cosmologies of an eternal universe, Sartre accepts one third of the Christian creation narrative. Creation from nothing. And this is his starting point. And this is the one great contribution of Christianity that set the world, specifically the Western mind, on its path, ironically, to nihilism. Sartre's section, entitled The Origins of Nothingness, lays out his basic understanding of metaphysics for the rest of the work. Sartre argues that being in itself, that famous term, being in itself, is the unconscious being that lay at the center of life itself. Because there is no rational creation, thus 
the beginning point is not consciousness, but the unconscious. Here, Sartre is specifically rejecting Kant and Hegel, and Hegel especially, both of whom take the Christian presupposition of a rational cosmos and a rational conscious at the heart of the universe. Sartre does not accept the Kantian and Hegelian position that a subject can negate itself or that a subject is at the center of the universe. Negation and only negation is at the beginning. We must recognize, Sartre says, that being can annihilate itself. However it comes about, in order to annihilate itself, it must be. But nothingness is not. Nothingness does not annihilate itself. Nothingness is annihilated. Typical of French philosophy, this word soup and a bunch of fantastical terminological talk with seemingly little ability for the reader to understand is actually something deeply profound. And it's important for us to really unpack and to understand what Sartre means here. Creation from nothing means, and nothingness is at the center of the universe, creation from nothing means we are annihilated from our own nothingness. We emerge from nothingness and create the world anew in the sense that we are constantly socially constructing all reality. That is at the heart of Sartre's metaphysic. We cannot truly annihilate ourselves because nothingness cannot be annihilated, yet in constructing anything, we are destroying our sort of original nothingness by creating something that we will then destroy and transcend into another realm of understanding, existence, and creation. Thus, because I am the being in itself, through raising consciousness, I negate my own being. Being in itself and becoming aware of my freedom leads me to understand that there is actually nothing in the world that I am bound to. There is no fixity to anything in nature. There is no hard definition to the order of creation. Sartre therefore returns us to a famous Greek philosopher, Protagoras, that man is at the center of the universe and that the center of the universe is ultimately nothing but the playhouse of man. Man, for all intents and purposes, is, for Sartre, God. Man and man alone possesses the ability to create, destroy, think, determine, accept, reject, judge, encounter, decide, etc. Man and man alone is the creator of all things because he creates from nothing. The world is waiting to be created by human energy. And contrary to Hegel, where man is becoming free over the process of history, Sartre takes the position that man in his being is freedom itself, because freedom itself can only exist, according to Sartre, if there is nothing imposing on us, nothing that binds us to any form of transcendental truth. If there was truth and order to the cosmos, which we are able to come into union with, we, by definition, according to Sartre, would not be free, because freedom, for Sartre, entails pure self-creation. For we would be submitting ourselves to a higher power or a force of law if there was something external to us. Sartre's liberty doesn't entail any degree of ontological flourishing for our freedom as it is in the ancient philosophies and Christian theology. Our essence is pure self-creation. In this sense, Sartre is a modern philosopher par excellence. That is the core concept of modern philosophy, beginning with Machiavelli and proceeding forward with Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, and Descartes, 
Pure self-creation is the essence of modern philosophy and modern understandings of nature. This, of course, is unsettling for most people because there is no direction to guide us in the cosmos. Instead, we are adrift. We are alone. There is nothing to guide our hands. As Sartre says, man does not exist first in order to be free subsequently. He's critiquing Hegel here. There is no difference between the being of man and his being free. Because there is no order, because there is no external law, no higher power, we assume all of the responsibilities for creation. We assume all of the responsibilities for our actions. And that is a terrifying proposition for many. Thus, what is the origin of the cosmos? Nothingness. What does this mean? Man is the creator of the cosmos insofar that man attempts in his freedom to prescribe meaning to the cosmos. This is why Sartre is a metaphysical, quote-unquote, libertarian. You shouldn't understand that term in metaphysical philosophy via politics. Metaphysical libertarianism means man has free will and the cosmos has no order to it. All there is is free will, and through our exercise of free will, humans determine everything. Everything. We determine our nature. We determine our society. We determine our morality. We determine our understanding of the world. We determine our science. We determine our mathematics. Everything is purely constructed based on human choice. Once man comes to know his nothingness, he feels great anguish over himself. He is filled with dread and anxiety. Man has expectations, but to fall short of such expectations creates that anguish, that anxiety. We once again see the Sartrean dialectic at work. My expectations and my possibility of failing, falling short of those expectations, create anguish, which is a reflection of my consciousness and the enhancement of my consciousness. It causes me to realize freedom. Anxiety and anguish is a manifestation of our coming to terms with the existential dread of our liberty. It is the realization that I am the center of the universe. And since the universe has no end to which it is moving forward, it has no law guiding it, there is no God or higher power that created it, the conclusion that I ultimately reach in the confines of my consciousness, and this is the ultimate moment of freedom and self-exertion, according to Sartre, I am the mover and the creator of the cosmos. Sartre claims that this moment of realization of nothingness, which is freedom, is the moment of vertigo. The vertigo for Sartre is the moment that we experience dread anguish when we sit at the precipice of a cliff, coming to the realization that I can throw myself off the cliff to my death, and thus my own annihilation. I literally control everything in my life. It is on the precipice we see the crisis of freedom of possibility. Nothingness is all that is guaranteed in life. Anticipation of falling to death produces fear. One becomes a mere thing as a result. I realize that despite possessing consciousness, that my body is frail. In this, I recognize the inherent dilemma of all existence. I am an object with subjectivity. I am not a subject embodied in an object, but I am an object that possesses consciousness. It is in this moment of vertigo that we truly come to understand what freedom entails. 
Choice is completely yours, but choice has consequences. For those who wish to choose without consequences, live in bad faith, according to Sartre. True freedom entails taking responsibility for every and all actions that one takes in life. You can be free while wanting to reject. I'm sorry, you cannot be free, according to Sartre, while wanting to reject consequences. Sartre would say to many of us moderns living today who want to be free but not face any consequences for our choices that you are living in bad faith. Freedom necessitates consequences, consequences and responsibilities. Every action you take in life, you must bear the responsibility for because it is you and only you and no one else and nothing else that caused you to make that choice. Your absolute free will, your absolute freedom to choose is purely from you, yourself, and no one else. And you must bear the burden of that responsibility. This leads to Sartre's tripartite ontology and dialectic. Being in itself, object with consciousness without the realization of freedom, progressing to being for itself, object with consciousness, realizing its freedom, and then continuing forward to being for others, object with consciousness that rejects its freedom to be subservient to others. These are the three stages and the three beings of human existence. Being for itself, which is the most primitive form of existence. Being for itself, which is the ideal existence for humans. And being for others, the unintentional subversion and self-enslavement that most of the modern world has embraced. The thesis of existence is the being in itself. The antithesis of existence is the being for itself. The historical synthesis is being for others, but Sartre rejects the temptation to move into the being for others because this would be a sign of bad faith and a suppression of our freedom. Sartre's dialectic situates itself permanently in the antithesis. We must always choose to be the being for itself. The great lie of modern philosophy, of German idealism, of Christianity, of Greek philosophy, of every intellectual idea that had existed before Sartre was that they moved us in the direction of being for others because they all accepted some notion of a rational cosmos and the reality of love to whom you would serve and love the other. Instead, Sartre is arguing that all philosophy, theology, cosmology, all ethics must ultimately be within being for itself. This is the highest expression of my acceptance of the reality of life, that I make a conscious choice to always be for myself. We can never go back to being in itself. Consciousness has forever removed us from being an object without consciousness. Thus, the battle in life is the wrestling between the freedom of being for oneself versus the slavery of being for others. In Being and Nothingness, Sartre gives the formulation that existence precedes essence. I am not defined by any nature, any essence. My existence, my freedom, allows me to control what I am and what I can be at all times. There is absolutely no essentialism to Sartre's view of human life, existence, science, nature, and the cosmos. Thus, for Sartre, his metaphysics of nothingness follows as such. We exist. We become consciously aware of our existence 
which destroys the being in itself. This is the origin of annihilation. We are free and creative or destructive beings. We create our meaning or essence through constant choices and we must constantly be in a state of creativity. One can note here the Nietzschean influence over Sartre. The reality of freedom is burdensome. We arrive at anguish when we realize the totality of our freedom and all the consequences that come with choices. Freedom becomes a burden because we realize that we are nothing. We are existing for nothing, and we are going nowhere. There is no grand plan for our life, for our existence. We have an uncertain and unfixed future. We are in control. When we attempt to run from our freedom, we act in bad faith, which is the negation of our freedom to outside forces, generally in the form of becoming being for others, which is bad. It is very easy to adopt a being for somebody else in order to assuage our own anxiety, but this is bad. This is living in bad faith because we subvert our freedom. Paradoxically, we affirm our freedom in running from our freedom because the abandonment of our freedom is a free choice made by a free subject. The ability to reject this freedom presupposes consciousness, which affirms our freedom in order to run away from our freedom. Therefore, we are ultimately and always in a constant state of flux. And this flux is the flux of choice, which constitutes our freedom. Freedom is not something rationally ordered, but something that is chaotic and comes from the void. It comes from our pure choice in everything that we do. For Sartre, humans are condemned to be free, but this freedom is without any guidance, because if we had guidance, we wouldn't be free. Creation comes after existence, because we create all things in our free choices, whereby our existence creates and provides meaning, but we must engage in this creativity constantly. To not choose is itself a choice. We must never fall into acceptance of our past choices, but must constantly be in a state of perpetual choosing and creation. What is the origin of nothingness? We are. All of Sartre's fancy language and his incomprehensibility can be boiled down to this. The universe has no meaning to it. There is no order to the cosmos. We exist in the meaningless universe, but have this gift called consciousness, which allows us to experience and live in the world as more than mere objects. By being an object that possesses consciousness, we resolve the dualism of subject and object. Our freedom is tied to that consciousness. The ability to choose how to live, how to create, and even how to destroy ourselves. This realization of freedom is our own doing. It is deeply unsettling. From this anguish of freedom, we choose to either accept freedom and face all the consequences that emanate from it, good or bad, or we can choose to reject freedom and live for others and become subservient to external things and forces. This is living in bad faith. We must never embrace a life of happiness and contentment because that is ultimately the end of our striving and our choosing. The final and ultimate conclusion we reach from our experience in the cosmos is that we are in control of everything. Man controls and creates everything that he wills. 
Just as God created from nothing in the Christian account of creation, for Sartre, man creates from nothing. Just as God created man free in the Christian account of creation and endowed him with a conscious soul, man truly is free and conscious and the only animal in the entire cosmos that possesses that freedom and consciousness. The difference, of course, is that man's freedom is rooted in his rebellion and not union with the good, the true, or the beautiful. The bad faith of Christianity, according to Sartre, was to create a greater subjectivity beyond that of man, God, and claiming that we should be in union with that subjectivity. The freedom of uncertainty has led to established orders and systems which inhibit and prohibit man's freedom and creativity. But the 20th century is showing, for Sartre, the true genius of man, his genius to deceive his genius, to realize his original freedom. According to Sartre, what all other philosophers, theologians, and thinkers failed is recognizing that our freedom is purely self-centered. This is not bad, as all the other great philosophers, theologians, and thinkers had originally thought. This is the only thing that is worth living for. And despite the giant work that is being in nothingness, ultimately, Sartre's philosophy is that you are an object that possesses consciousness, and in that consciousness, you choose to be whatever you are, you choose to live the life of whatever you choose to live by, and in doing that, you are free. You live a life without any guidance, without any higher power, without any rational understanding, without any ability to love. All there is, is your choices, and you must bear the responsibility of the choices you make in life.